Hello and welcome to my show. My name is Dave Dell. Here with you until four o'clock this Thursday afternoon. And today, today I have enormous, enormous pleasure to welcome uh, my guest, uh, composer and pianist and conductor Konstantin Karavasilis, who we've had before on my show, but he's he's only appeared. Uh, remotely through the phone today he's in ottawa this this weekend he's here in person and he's going to be p- appearing he's at a concert tomorrow night with the 13 strings and uh with two of his pieces including a brand new uh, commission uh hello welcome constantine uh, dave thanks for for having me it's a great honor and uh well this um there's this concert uh let's we'll start off let's talk about 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 this piece uh, the piece entitled uh, "Silver Angel" and it's, it's, uh, it's a concerto for bassoon and thirteen strings. Yes. And uh, tell us about it. it sounds it's, uh, my latest work. Well, actually, no, I've started writing something else since then. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, it's like you said, a bassoon uh, concerto for bassoon and thirteen strings. Uh, it can be played for with double that actually, and. Um, <coughs> It was a project that was started by Kevin Mullen, who conducts the 13 Strings, and Nadina. Nadina and I met at the University of Toronto. I was conducting a new music ensemble there, and she was playing a concerto. And uh, we connected there, and um, she told me about her uh, Canadian concerti project. And she said that uh, so far she's had, I think, six concerti written for her. And she said that um, I'm ready for the next one, so (laughs) would she be up for the challenge? So uh, that's how it started. And uh, this, this piece, I mean, you, you provided a description of, of, of kind of the inspiration uh, for this work. And uh, I think like a lot of, a lot of your music, it, it's, it's very, very richly emotional. It's mm-hmm. very deep mm-hmm. uh, and, and profound, very personal music, yeah. but also reaching outwards uh, to, to the larger, larger world. Yeah. Uh, could tell us about, about this. Uh, well, uh, this is... Um it's a bit depressing to talk about it because the piece is uh, dedicated to the uh, loving memory of my, my grandmother, yes. who, uh, who died a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it's v- it's very particular because it's it just a lot of uh, stories that are not connected between them, but they carry similar messages. They're coming together in this yes. piece. Um, when I first started writing the piece, I really didn't know what it was going to be about. And I actually paused from composing it and wrote another concerto before I wrote it. <laughs> uh, the other concerto is, so, uh, is called Soul Tones, and it's for two flute string orchestra with a uh, uh, crazy timpani part. <laughs> 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 that was a commission from a, f- a duo based in uh, Toronto. And the first movement was premiered in uh, Monterrey, Mexico. But, um, I, but I left it because I... Uh, I had ideas of how to use the bassoon in a um, in a concerto <coughs> setting, um, but I didn't really feel that I had a particular theme in terms of uh, talking extra musically. So uh, it just uh, stayed there for for a few months, and then, um, like I say in the program notes, when I um, reports st- started coming in uh, about the uh, ISIS and what it's doing. Actually, I follow uh, the news not only uh, on Canadian television. I follow the news as they are reported by other networks, especially (laughs) Eastern European. And uh, I can tell you that uh, they're very, very graphic. Yes. And they have uh, a really strong impact. So looking at the pictures of uh, people being beheaded, I just thought if I wrote a piece as a university student that was kind of an anti-war piece, I would feel that it's very pretentious because we live in Toronto. Yes. It's a very comfortable place to live. Yes. You know. We don't go through that sort of thing. Um, so I thought that that was the time for me to do something like that. And then at the same time, my family started uh, communicating the bad news that uh, my grandmother was not going to last <laughs> for too long. Yes. And I was really uh, deeply connected with her in a spiritual way, actually. So uh, those two things came together, and the first movement uh, its probably very depressing for the audience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so then when I completed the first movement, uh, I thought that um, I want to give my music and the audience and the bassoon uh, soloist a chance to uh, not leave the concert hall, you know, feeling like wearing black clothes or anything. <laughs> so then a new dawn came as the second movement, and uh, in that movement I thought, 
to well I'm t at the first movement it's sort of like a requiem uh, it has some uh, moments where um, I, w I don't want to say exactly what it is. you've yes. seen the score you know yes. uh, there's some special effects uh, produced by the string players um, that don't really have to do with them playing their instruments <laughs> <laughs> um, but in the second movement I thought well let's lighten up a little bit Yes, let's lighten up the mood. Let's do something really contrasting. And of course, one of the people that came to mind is Sostakovich. Huh. <laughs> it's heavy political music, but uh, using um, there are just uh, principles that are in the music. They envelop so many different meanings. If you hear it out of, of context, it kind of sounds really stupid. But <laughs> if you really know what's going on, it's uh, so. The second movement is. Uh, I took one of the melodies of, uh, that my grandmother used to sing to me when I was a child, and uh, I made it into, I transformed it a little bit, making it into a Mannheim rocket. Yes. And I, u and I used a little bit of jazz um, rhythms and, and harmonies, um, <coughs> pseudo baroque um, entrances, uh, things like that, just to create a movement that uh, would be something that she would enjoy. <laughs> And that's why it's called the New Dawn. It's very, it's like a big dance. It's, it's rather they're long for a dance. It lasts like seven, eight minutes. Uh, I mean, it sounds. Reading the scripture, look at the score. I, I can't wait to see it. And of course, I should mention the concert is tomorrow night, here in uh, in Ottawa, at eight p.m. And by with uh, thirteen strings and uh, of course Nadina Mackey Jackson, solo bassoonist. And uh, it is playing at St. Andrew's Church. That's on uh, uh, Kent Street, so right downtown. It's, it's a great, great uh, venue, and uh, should, not, should not be missed. Uh, if your student tickets are only only ten dollars, and uh, ranges up to forty dollars, well worth it. Um, and uh, th this uh, this piece, um, you know, it wasn't until today you mentioned mentioned Shostakovich, and, and that uh, that made sense to me. That made mm -hmm. sense to me because. Uh, as the Shostakovich he always he so so often contrasted the the great tragedy exactly with, with and these, it, these it, almost sometimes it's within the same piece yeah. Yeah. and sometimes it's within the same so movement yes and uh, something yeah. really grotesque happens and then uh, you, it leaves you wondering why is this happening right now the music was so serious yes <laughs> we were in the middle of a war and now it's like sort of like bunnies a carnival <laughs> yes yeah, yeah. Um, and. Uh, you mentioned is that that you imagine you imagine that your grandmother would would have loved uh, this this kind of kind of music. Uh, was, was she a, a, a big musical influence on you? I wouldn't say musical influence. I mean musical influence in terms of somebody being really really young and and having somebody uh, sing all the original tunes to them. Um, but she was actually she uh, wrote her own poetry. I don't think she ever wrote it down. I think she just had it in memory. Yes. But she had complete poems from memory. Yeah. And um, she often put melodies to them. But the melodies, I found, are very... Those are very imaginative ones. Yes. Of course, she, without knowing it, she used uh, the modes, <laughs> <laughs> the original modes. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I find that... Uh, I remember just three or four, maybe. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I find them that... Yeah, this particular melody, I mean, listen to it tomorrow. It's a real... You know, it has a beginning and an end and a uh, middle section, like uh -huh. very well constructed. Huh. Yeah. So I thought maybe she could have been a composer. <laughs> but she lived in a different era and part of the world. Well, that, that's great. And, and I should mention there are two pieces uh, being performed. The other one uh, is called Message in a Bottle, and that's uh, yeah. just, uh, it's for string orchestra. Yes. <coughs> and... Uh, I see that you, uh, you pulled up the poster, uh, and before I forget, I have to credit the, the Ontario Arts Council for um, supporting this project. Uh, uh, without them, there would be no way uh, that we, um, you know, Ontario-based composers. <laughs> we have other arts councils, but especially yeah. the Ontario Arts Council has really helped a lot That's of great. young people. Yeah, That's great. Um, so, so can you tell me a little bit about the other piece? Uh, the um, message, in the the message in a bottle, uh, completely different piece. It yeah. uh, has to do with, it's a much more imaginative, uh, has nothing to do with war, has nothing to do with death. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the message in a bottle was commissioned by the Canadian Composers Orchestra and was premiered by them and Gary Kulesha conducting. I think that was in 2008. Uh, the Canadian Composers Orchestra doesn't really exist. It's sort of like a pickup uh, ensemble, but of very, very good musicians that are handpicked by Gary Kulesha. And for anyone who doesn't know who Gary Kulesha is, he's a <coughs> Toronto-based composer who's a uh, composer advisor with the Toronto Symphony. 
uh, and professor at the University of Toronto where I studied. I've had, <laughs> him, on, I've had him on my show a couple years ago. Oh, okay, yeah. cool. And um, so they, um, they have a workshop for young composers to which I didn't apply, uh, but they had a space for an extra piece and then uh, uh, one of the people that uh, worked for Gary uh, organizing this, uh, they called me and they said, would you like a piece, one of your pieces performed? We, you don't have to go through the mentoring process. <laughs> uh, they thought I was, I don't know, advanced or something. So I said, yeah, sure. So I wrote this piece. Uh, it's 10 minutes long. And um, it does, I mean, there's uh, quite a bit of meaning b behind the title. Uh, when I was uh, really young, um, you know I, that I grew up in a Greek island. Yes. <coughs> and that my uh, parents used to run a hotel. Mm -hmm. and and uh, we had a lot of tourists that uh, were famous pianists, and so they would, you know, uh, come to the reception area where the piano was, and they would uh, practice or play. Well, in the summer months, I wasn't supposed to practice. I was <laughs> supposed to play what I learned in the winter. <laughs> so um, there was a pianist from Switzerland. Um, they came uh, for vacation, and it just so happened that he came to our hotel, and uh, he gave up completely on his vacation schedule and started observing my p daily piano practice yeah. giving me lessons and um, I think uh, they both uh, himself and his wife they think they fell in love with a little boy from the Greek island who plays <laughs> Bach <laughs> so uh, they started uh, taking me to uh, uh, out for ice cream and stuff like that and so the um, I don't remember his name I wish I could uh, run into them again uh, when I visit the island um, he told me a story. Um, he asked me, what, a, you know, what do you want to do when you gr grow up? And I said, I want to be a composer, but I don't know what a composer has to do uh, until they're, you know, they have a final uh, product. Right. And then he said, well, you need to have musical themes. And then he started telling me this uh, fairy tale hmm. uh, that has to do with uh, finding the world's greatest themes uh, on the shore in inside a bottle. So when I was writing this piece, I thought of this story, and I thought uh, that would be wonderful. And uh, one of the the main musical theme in the piece um, is um, a musical theme that I wrote when I was really, really young, I think maybe seven or eight years old. Uh, I mean, and by writing it, I mean you know I kind of invented it on the piano. I never really wrote it down, but I I did rem I do remember it. So I used it, and I I made a, a ten minute uh, string orchestra piece out of it. Well, that sounds sounds amazing, and I, I will have to, to try and. Oh, and by the way, the 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 more extra musical story uh, behind the actual music. Kind of, uh, I'm sort of describing what I saw in the, my imagination of the bottle that contains the world's greatest musical themes. Uh, you know, uh, under the water, over the water, waves, and the the sun, and, you know, reflecting over the glass and stuff like that. But that sounds great, yeah. and. Uh, I mean, I mentioned before uh, when I had you before, you talked about your synesthesia. Yeah. By uh, the way, am I am I doing okay with the microphone? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did uh, you know? How did the synesthesia? Like, uh, your music is so personal. Like, you, you're telling these stories. The music has, uh, it goes back to your childhood sometimes. Yes. It's 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 always and and and, and your visions, uh, talking about your the experiences, inspirations of for each yeah. of the piece. Always so so personal. Uh, how does the synesthesia, you think, uh, influence that? Well, um, that's a very interesting question. Um, but before we go into this, I should tell you that um, in academia, synesthesia, w I mean, in musical, academic musical circles, uh, it, when somebody's a synesthet, uh, a lot of people expect that they would be coming up with music that's very uh, avant-garde oriented. Hmm. And that's a real mistake because... Synesthesia is just a condition in the human brain, yeah. and it doesn't have to do with your liking in terms of musical style. <laughs> I was not aware of that. That's, that's, yes, that's, well, yeah. that's kind of a strange uh, <laughs> assumption. And uh, Well, but it is an assumption that a lot of people falsely make. You know? um, but beyond that, um, the effect that synesthesia has uh, had in my music so far is a two-folded one. The first is the, p the, f the fact that I would use a certain color w when I'm writing a um, specific section in a piece, and I didn't know, th before I found out that I'm a synesthet, that I'm actually using the same color to finish the phrase. But uh, when I, s when I uh, found out that I'm a synesthet, I thought that was really, really cool. So then um, I started creating music that's based on my synesthetic reaction. 
I don't know if I've ever talked to you about my, my work, Concerto for Synesthets. No. Okay. Um, I had an opportunity um, to uh, write a concerto for three solo cello and cello orchestra as part of the Open Strings Festival at the island of Lolland in uh, Denmark. And uh, the piece was premiered at the uh, Rodentörn, the Round Tower in Copenhagen. Um, and that's a couple of years after I found out what synesthesia is and the fact that I'm a synesthet and the fact that my synesthetic condition is triggered by low string sounds, hmm. mostly, for the most part. Uh, and the bassoon. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> there's a little bit of that there tomorrow. But uh, no, the bassoon concerto is not really a, a synesthesia influence. Yeah. I just had a couple of reactions when... Uh, Nadina played the part for me. <laughs> um, but anyway, in this piece, what I tried to do is I created uh, three measures of music, detuning cello, the solo, celli, and uh, reconstructing the entire cello orchestra. Uh, so there is about 28 cellos on stage. And uh, I, I tried to write three measures, making sure that I have a synesthetic reaction within the three measures of music. Yeah. And then what I, I did is I, I gave up uh, on form completely. I gave up on uh, thematic material completely. I gave up on everything. And I just wrote music making sure that I still have a synesthetic reaction in every bar. Well, that piece is the most uh, well-constructed piece I've ever written. Wow. And it was written completely by the use of the part of the brain that's not supposed to be the composer part of the <laughs> brain. <laughs> it's supposed to be the, uh, I'm wiring messages from one part to the other. We should just give a very brief uh, definition of what synesthesia is. It's uh, the crossing of perceptions in, in the mind, meaning that, uh, you know, you hear a note and you see a color. Um, I hear a note and I see a color or sh I, I, can, uh, I see a shape and I uh, experience tastes and smells. I'm working on devising a method uh, to compose just using uh, synesthesia. But, I mean, that will take a lifetime <laughs> and even more. <laughs> so, no, I believe that every uh, synesthet is, is, is different. Every different synesthet and, is different. And unique yeah. in their Absolutely. reactions. Absolutely. So. Especially when, uh, I w when I was invited to give a lecture uh, for the American Synesthesia Association uh, when they visited Toronto. Um, they had one of their conferences at uh, UFT. So um, they had invited uh, a composer, um, and then they had a lot of uh, people that are visual artists who are synesthetes. And it was really striking at how different everybody is. There was a person who said that when he has synesthetic reactions, he sees boxes. Hmm. Uh, I'm sure that's like the complete opposite of the absolute savage. <laughs> but I said, what kind of boxes? He's like, I don't know, carton boxes. And I, and I said, well, what does the box mean? Oh, no, no, every box has its own particular color. Oh, mm. there you go. Yeah, okay. so it's very different for everybody. Sing synesthet. Yeah, the, uh, of course, that raises the question that, that piece, the specific concerto that, that you wrote, the, the synesthet uh, piece, uh -huh. have, have you... Ha uh, Played it or, or had another synesthet uh, listen to it and then compare uh, reactions? A couple of uh, uh, colleagues of mine who are synesthets listened to it. One got nothing out yeah. of it. And the other one said that the color of brown that keeps, uh, and you keep getting all the different kinds of colors that are, you know, similar, come out from brown, becomes yellow. And I said, no, that's the piece is not about that at all. <laughs> <laughs> that's not what yeah. I see. I see shapes, I see all different kinds of things. You know, it's a very, very unique yeah. to, to everyone. Yeah. Well, I want to talk a, a, a bit more. I mean, you mentioned uh, that uh, the piece you had played in, and it was performed in Mexico, and we do have an excerpt. Um, we, they re we recorded the first movement of that concerto, and your, your, your pieces are being performed uh, mm -hmm. outside of Canada. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a great There's thing. It's a, a great lot. thing for Canadian composers. <laughs> um, finally. <laughs> finally. And uh, well, let's, let's listen to one, uh, the Rhapsody Impromptu yeah. for, for uh, piano and saxophone. Okay. Um, I, can I give you some info? Yeah, of course. Okay. Of course. Uh, Rhapsody Impromptu, um, it's a piece for sax in one movement piece for saxophone and piano. Uh, commissioned by uh, sa Greek saxophonist Stathis Mavromatis. And in this recording, uh, this is from uh, <coughs> Greek uh, National Greek Radio before it was uh, the, the old one, because it's, it's been transformed now with the uh, yeah. change of garments and all that. Um, uh, Chris Christina Padeli is playing the piano, and Stathis Mavromatis is playing the saxophone, and this was recorded at the old uh, Studio 2 of the Hellenic Broadcasting Corporation. 
Now, here's a piece where I just... It's just straight music. Mm-hmm. There's, it's, and it, the title, I think, says it. It's very rhapsodic, yes. but it's really an impromptu. It's just I was just improvising, and I came up with something that I thought uh, that my f- saxophonist friend would like. And then I wrote it down and sent it to the part and said, does that work? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Here, keep it. <laughs> and, oh, it's, it's a gorgeous piece. So Thank you. We're going to uh, run out to it, and then we'll be back with uh, Constantine here on CKCU 93.1. You're listening to CKCU 93.1 FM in Ottawa. And we're back. I am, I am here speaking with Constantine Carvasilis, a Toronto-based a composer and a pianist. And he is here in live in studio because he's here uh, this weekend for a concert being given tomorrow night. It's entitled Message in a Bottle, named after one of the two pieces uh, being performed of his by Third Ottawa's 13 Strings uh, Chamber Orchestra. Uh, tomorrow night they're playing at St. Andrew's Church. Uh, the concert time is 8 p.m. Uh, they're playing the, 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 the sp- uh, sh- sh- string orchestra piece, Message in a Bottle, and uh, the premiere the premiere of Silver Angel Concerto for Bassoon and String Orchestra uh, with famed uh, uh, Canadian bassoonist Nadina Mackey Jackson. And uh, very, very excited about this, about this piece. We spoke about it earlier and very much looking forward to this concert and to hearing this, this work. And we just heard there a uh, Rhapsody Impromptu for a saxophone and a piano um, performed by uh, Stathis Mavromatis and Christina Pantelli and uh, a concert or a recording uh, from, from Greece. And, uh, well, I, there's another piece that we're, we're going to be... Mm-hmm. I, I really wanted to, to, to play uh, this, this piece. And um, it's a piece we've heard we've heard several times on my, my show before, and this is a uh, it, it's I, I believe it's a, a, your first your first uh, commercial uh, recording here in Canada mm-hmm. of, of your work uh, entitled Visions, a complete books of rhapsodies and fantasias, a uh, uh, set of uh, ten pieces and two different books for solo piano, and uh, we've played it a lot on my show. All ten of the pieces have appeared. Uh, some of them several times, re- uh, recorded with Christina Petrowska Quilico, who we've also had on my show, wonderful, wonderful uh, pianist and uh, extraordinary, extraordinary woman and, 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 and thinker. Um, but what I, I find really, really n- neat and, and, and happy about, uh, about this is that here we have another recording of a new piece, um, yeah, by, so by another hopefully pianist. Hopefully many, many, many more. Hopefully many more. Because yeah. <laughs> um, uh, that... Uh, there's a lot of differences uh, between between different musicians playing the same piece of music. It's a, it's a reason why I, in my collection, I have over 50 recordings of mm-hmm. uh, at least sonata in B minor. Mm-hmm. But uh, and the, it, it, it's easy to have that many recordings, have a lot of different perspectives on, on the main repertoire, yeah. like the, the famous pieces. Well, I'm but not main repertoire. That's no, that is a problem with uh, new compositions and, mm. and new pieces. That so many of, of my newer pieces in, in, in I've heard in my collection, only one recording of it exists. Um, and so you only have this one interpretation that you can become familiar with. And uh, that, that's a shame because there's, there's so much to be gained from hearing different musicians yeah. approach the same piece yeah. of music. And that's what I'm excited about this, that uh, we have here a Greek a pianist, uh, uh, Maria Picula. Maria Picula, yeah. Picula, right. playing one of, uh, one of your pieces, uh, that the, the same piece uh, that Christina has played. And Lumen de Lumina. Lumen de Lumina. And tell me a bit about, about, about her. You, you, you know this Maria Picula yeah. and, uh, and I were um, going to the same school, the University yeah. of Toronto. And we became friends. And since then, Maria has moved to the States. She continued uh, school in uh, New York and Boston. And uh, she um, she played uh, a couple of my pieces when I was in third year undergrad. And I thought I, I loved her interpretations. I loved her personality. Um, and I love also the part that uh, we uh, not only spoke the same language language, but also <laughs> physically, interpretively. interpretively. Um, so Maria is recording uh, her first commercial recording, and she asked uh, if I would be willing to give her one of my pieces to add to her repertoire. And I thought, well, here's this score, and here's another score, and here's another score. And she chose that piece. Uh, she gave the European premiere of it at the Lumen Center in London, 
Um, I think that was a couple of years ago. I'm sorry with that. There's so much going on with projects right now. <laughs> that I just, yeah, uh, maybe it's two and a half years ago, <laughs> but it was in London, England for sure, and it was at the Lumen Center. Um, and um, she recorded it at uh, State of the Art Studio in Boston, and it's ready to go. I think it's going to be the last track on her first uh, commercial recording, uh, which will have uh, you know a standard repertoire kind of pieces, uh, uh, theme and variation. I think, kind of uh, recording, yes. and then it will end with my piece. So it's a big honor uh, to to have to have that happen. And like I I I, I fell in love with 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 your music from Visions when uh, and so this is my my first introduction to to, to you and, and your mm-hmm. music uh, when when I got th- this recording, and I mean reading through the the, the titles, reading through the descriptions, like well this this sounds like it's 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 music right right down my. Uh, my alley, uh, right in my alley. That uh, right, and it's uh, the extraordinary, extraordinary pieces. So I've listened to it a lot. I've actually re-listened to it uh, just the past week, again. And uh, Lumen de Lumines, this is a wonderful piece. And uh, Christina Przewska, I mean, she, her, her performance of, of your your work is is wonderful, it's mm-hmm. incredible. Um, but it's the only is it was the only interpretation it's I've, so far I've known. Yeah. I you know yeah. I've known that I've I've heard a lot. I have not heard yourself play it. Uh, <laughs> play this music. Come to Toronto. <laughs> um, and uh, then I heard I heard uh, Maria's uh, performance, mm-hmm. and it was it was very different. It was, it was very different. Uh, I have uh, I have to tell you something else. You know the third person that's played this piece, mm. Hans Southam. Oh yes, it, that was, and that was a different experience. I mean. She played it, she kind of sight read it, yes. and then she stopped and said, Oh, um, the third time it returns, if you do this, <laughs> yeah. be a real minimalist. <laughs> <I> thought, wow. <laughs> yeah, so that, uh, um, apart from having the great honor of having Maria Picula record this piece and play it, uh, she's, she's played other pieces of mine, and she's, uh, I hope she plays it in, in concert again. Um, the. The big lesson with this piece was when I showed it to Anne Southam, to which it is now... Dedicated? <coughs> yes, it's yeah. dedicated to the memory of Anne yeah. Southam. Uh, because I think it was uh, the first time I, I st- when I started experimenting with minimalism. Now, there are minimalist yes. influence <laughs> influences in, in a lot of my yeah, music, yeah. but uh, I just wanted to have a minimal piece in terms of, you know, it's not really developing, but she really... And you know who she directed in me to? Uh, to learn about minimalism, I was blown away when she said the name because the guy is not does not identify as a minimalist. Keith Jarrett. Oh, I'm not surprised. Yeah, and she said, uh, "If only tomorrow night and tell me what do." Uh, yeah, she gave me two specific pieces by Bach, and she gave me a recording by Keith Jarrett. And that was our because I am a huge fan of Keith Jarrett. I am uh, yeah. as well. <laughs> and uh, but she didn't know that. And she said, uh, "Take these two Bach pieces and uh, this um, Keith Jarrett CD and phone me tomorrow night and tell me what do they have in common." And uh, I, I I did I th- I thought really hard. I had to think really hard. And I I phoned her and then I said, "I'm not sure what you mean in common, but if you're referring to minimalism." Both piece, uh, both composers, they find uh, a spot in their piece that something sticks, and they just keep spinning it out uh, once, twice, third, three times, four times, and just keep going, and then they get back to the. And she said, "This is, you know, where mi- minimalism was born." Yeah. yeah, you need to have something before it and after. There's minimalist composers who just write music that just doesn't have a beginning and an end. It just Kind of goes. <laughs> do, you, do you do you do you do you remember which I'm sure you which key chair recording it was that she gave you? Um, yes, uh, she gave me two CDs. One was the Köln concert that um, I had two, but I I had misplaced it. The other one was a recording that I think she found from a a kind of. A a source that cannot be announced, and it was uh, Keith Jarrett at home. Oh. Yeah, it was a very yeah, right. yeah. I don't think it exists. Yeah. I'm I am, and I'm pretty sure I copied it. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, yeah. yeah. yeah I'm you know, and Southam had some really weird connections yeah. uh, across uh, um, North America, and uh, she has had a, a very profound influence on in my music. Yeah. Yeah. I consider her actually. I went to university for seventy years. 
I had master classes with more than 25 award-winning composers and many professors, but I consider Anne South and those five, six meetings I had with her uh, to be my greatest teacher. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I'm, not, I'm not surprised. Yeah. And I'm very sad that she's gone, yes. but that's part of life. Yes, she's a wonderful, wonderful composer and, and woman. Yeah. So we're going to hear the uh, Lumen de Lumine with, with Maria and uh, her performance. And one of the things which I find really striking is, is a much slower tempo, which I love. I love the slower tempo yeah. uh, that she draws. And I, I hear I hear little a little ghost of Schubert in it. I just do that. That's just me. <laughs> I just hear That's Sch- exactly what Anne Southam said. But that, that's when I first heard it. Was like, and it, 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 it struck me. You know, I know, I know the, uh, the, the first recording of Christina uh, very well. I listened to it mm-hmm. a lot. And uh, so this one uh, just it really really struck me how different and, and I I loved it I loved the difference. Hmm. L- let's let's listen to it. Let's listen to it. Yes. So this is uh, Constantin uh, Kervasilis his uh, Lumen de Lumine, with a sneak peek at uh, the upcoming recording of this piece uh, from Maria Picula. Picula. Maria Picula. Maria yeah. Picula. Yeah. Yes. Pianist based in Boston. On CKCU ninety three point one. Enjoy. You're listening to CKCU 93.1 FM in Ottawa. And that was Maria Picula uh, with a performance, a uh, wonderful, wonderful Maria performance. Maria Picula. Picula. Yeah, there you go. Fantastic, fantastic <laughs> performance. That's the performance of Lumen it's de Lumine. Giving you goosebumps with your music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it sounds like conceit, but actually it's, no, it's, it's, it's a great uh, It's an extraordinary performance. Yeah. Um, and I say it's, it's, a, it's a really nice compliment with, with Christina's uh, yeah. performance. It's, it's it's great to hear. Uh, it's talking. It's really really wonderful to hear. Different interpretations of of, of new music. It, it, it's, it's, we don't often get that, and uh, that is f- coming from an upcoming album of hers, uh, which which I'll, I'll feature on my show uh, once it's out. Uh, she sounds like just a wonderful wonderful pianist. Well, well, I'm ba- I'm here with uh, Constantine Caravasilis, a composer. Based in Toronto, and he's here uh, live in studio because he's here in Ottawa for a premiere of uh, a new piece of music of his, a concerto for bassoon and string orchestra uh, called entitled Silver Angel, being performed uh, tomorrow night by Ottawa's 13 Strings with uh, soloist Nadina Mackey Jackson at St. Andrew's Church that's on uh, Kent Street, 82 Kent Street, right downtown. And uh, it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful show. I can't, can't wait to hear this piece. And as well, there's another piece uh, entitled Message in a Bottle uh, by, by Constantine, which will be featured as well. And then some music by uh, Vivaldi Handel and uh, a piece by uh, Canadian composer John Burge. Well, we're, we're, so we're back here and we listened to that piece. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to moving along to, to another piece of his mm-hmm. uh, fairly soon here. It's actually a cycle of, of songs yeah. titled Sappho, uh, and uh, <coughs> and it's actually for a trio, voice, piano, and flute. Yes, mezzo soprano. Mezzo soprano, <coughs> and, and 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 tell us a little bit about about this this work. Um, well, I'm very happy to report um, that I remember having a lesson with a very renowned composition teacher who said. Uh, once you write a piece, and this is how new music works, uh, you have one performance and premiere. You're lucky if you get a second performance, and then it goes to the drawer and you move to the next thing. And uh, my question at the time was, uh, well, what happens if, if X piece is just, uh, you know, supported by an arts council or a private organization? Uh, they don't, don't they want to see that the project has legs? Um, and I'm very happy that... Uh, a lot of, uh, of my friends who are performers, are, as their careers are taking off, they, they keep performing my music all over the world. I'm very, very happy and uh, very honored. Um, now you mentioned off-air that uh, as careers grow, uh, people are going to stop asking me for eight-minute trios and they're going to ask <laughs> start asking me for concertos, which is already happening. <laughs> uh, I look forward to that. Um this particular piece was um, a commissioned uh, a commissioned by a small series in Toronto called In Recital. Uh, In Recital was uh, organized by um, pianist Amanda Johnston, who has left Toronto since then, and she's uh, teaching at a university in South uh, 
one of the southern states, I don't remember which one, I think it's, she's in Mississippi. Um, <coughs> and uh, the way that that series was designed, uh, she would handpick a um, vocalist for each of the concerts and feature them and uh, for, the, for the entire concert, and then she would do the accompanying. So um, <coughs> Ariana Chris was a Greek-Canadian uh, mezzo-soprano, <coughs> she's she's known for singing the Greek anthem at the Vancouver uh, Olympic Games. Okay. Um, <coughs> she she asked me if I wanted to write a second song cycle for her. I had written one for her already that she competed with at the the Cardiff competition, world competition for voice <coughs> in Wales, and then she did in Boston and she did in Canada, and she recorded it for the CBC. So she started looking for a second cycle, and she, and we at the time were planning on um, having a third and fourth and uh, putting everything on a CD. Um, so she said, we want to have something with the Greek theme, but not in Greek language, because we already had that. So we took the poetry of Sappho. Um, we took uh, the, the ancient Greek, and then we, we found a modern Greek translation of the text, by Odyssea Selitis, who's a novelist poet. Um, and then we we gave that to a, a renowned translator who <coughs> translated for a third time to French, and I wrote the cycle for her. It's scored for flute, um, piano, and mezzo-soprano, and I think this is the sixth or seventh mezzo uh, different mezzo-soprano since Ariana Chris, who's doing the piece. Uh, the piece, by the way, won the coveted Karen Kieser Prize in Canadian Music. Um, and this particular recording is very, very fresh. It was done last week in Monterrey, Mexico. Uh, Cristina Velasco is the mezzo-soprano. So, uh, here it is on CKCU 93.1. Enjoy. You find I've gone away and a little bit of an unexpected tangent <laughs> there at the, the end of, of that uh, set with uh, Elsa McCreary, yes. a Toronto uh, jazz uh, vocalist and uh, her ensemble. An album, When Evening Is Nigh, beautiful, beautiful uh, song, After You've Gone. This was a choice by from Constantine, one of his yeah. favorite favorite singers. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's a wonderful recording. So, thanks for featuring it. Well, and it's a present. This this is for you. Oh, thank you. And uh, before that, of course, we heard that there's a song cycle set of five songs. Uh, the cycle is called Sappho de Midilen uh, by Constantine Caravasilis, uh, with uh, Christina Velasco mezzo mezzo soprano. Uh, and Chad Spears on piano, and uh, that's uh, 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 just recorded last week. You said yes, yes. It's brand new that, that he, he brought with us. Uh, beautiful, beautiful music. Of course, I'm um, speaking. And great, uh, great. They're all really young musicians yeah. and, and very good at what they do. Uh, I'm very honored. I want to thank them all, and thank you for having me on your show. Oh, thank you. Yes, and Constantine Caravasilis uh, joined me uh, for today's show. Uh, he <laughs> is appearing tomorrow night. With Ottawa's 13 Strings uh, Chamber Orchestra for uh, a concert uh, in, in, entitled uh, uh, "Message in a Bottle," and that's uh, the, the, the title of one of his pieces. And the other piece, I'm very, very, I'm excited about both of them. But the the, the new premiere of a piece entitled "Silver Angel." It's a concerto for solo bassoon and featuring soloist Nadina Mackey Jackson. And uh, we, we talked about early on, and I do uh, I do on uh, today's playlist ckcufm dot com. You will click on today's playlist. I, I do list uh, the notes that he had uh, in the score and a kind of introduction to the piece, and it it, it 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 sounds wonderful. I looked at the score, but I can't wait to hear it. I can't wait to hear it uh, th th tomorrow night, eight p.m. concert concert time. I do hope to see many of you out there. And, uh, well, again, thank you. Thank you very much thank for, you. for coming. Thank yeah, you. It's, it's a huge honor. Thank you. Well, it's a huge honor on, on my part. I'm so happy. This is, I believe, the third time you've mm -hmm. been on my show, oh. this time this time live. And I look forward to, to uh, talking to you again with uh, your, I mean, your career has really taken off. Yeah. I'm very excited about I'm that. I'm very happy. Projects <laughs> on the go. A lot of music, a lot of music yeah. waiting in the wings and uh, some, 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 uh, some new recordings uh, yeah. underway. And so a lot to look forward to in, in the future from, uh, from Constantine. Uh, so I'm going to leave you with I'm going to leave you with uh, uh, something I'll take you out to, to four o'clock uh, a piece by uh, Robert Schumann. 
his uh, violin concerto, and this is actually a quite an obscure piece uh, by, by Schumann. Um, his, his, his violin concerto was, was not published until uh, decades uh, after his death. Uh, his contemporaries, it, 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 uh, he composed it in 1854, just a couple of years before his death. And uh, the, the, the dedicatee uh, uh, for, for this concerto, he thought it reflected almost the, a bit of his uh, insanity that uh, he uh, ultimately died from. And he just, he just didn't believe it was a good piece. So it was actually, it was actually suppressed for, for uh, nearly 70 years. And it's a wonderful piece in D minor, a wonderful concerto. And I'm, I'm, um, it's, it's kind of sad that it's, it's so obscure compared to his piano concerto, which is one of the most uh, commonly played concertos uh, globally. And it's it's uh, it's recorded thousands of times. It's one of my favorites too. Yeah. It's it's, uh, yeah, it's a I wonderful it. it's a wonderful piano concerto. We but were just talking uh, about this piano concerto with Christina yesterday. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. she played it with TSO, and uh, we're talking about different pianists doing it. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, it's, it's this violin concerto is, I believe, I believe very much belongs in the same stature as as, as the and piano who, concerto. And who is the soloist here? Uh, this is a new recording in Harmonie Mundi uh, with Isabel Faust uh, mm -hmm. with uh, the Freiburger Baroque Orchestra and uh, Pablo Harris uh, Casado conducting. Oh, yeah. So let's take you out to 4 o'clock when Janice will come in with her great uh, program. And thank you all for listening. A very special show today, and I'll see you next week at 2 p.m. Bye for now. CKCU 93.1.